I'm not sure if the space is working. I don't see my I, uh, profile picture up here. So let me see what's going on real quick. I'm going to close it out and come back in and see if that works. So I'm gonna go ahead and record it. I can't see there's on my screen, I'm having like some kind of glitch. So it's not showing whether or not people are in the space. I don't even see my own profile picture. So I'm gonna just go ahead and go. Hopefully it's recording. I don't even see like a request or speakers, but I don't even see anybody in here. It's just showing like a black screen. Let me try something real quick. So for the recording, I am reading aloud the color of law, but I'm having tech issues. So I'm going to see what's going on. So I'm going to go on mute. Oh, okay. Yo, Shahid, appreciate you. I couldn't. I, so he just told me that you are in here. I don't know if someone can request a co-host because for some reason I'm having tech issues. And I just see like a blank screen and it keeps uh, just showing like connecting. So it's recording. All right. So I'm going to just go ahead and read. If y'all request, it's not because I'm ignoring y'all. I literally can't see anything on my screen. It's just all black. So I'm going to go ahead and go and hopefully everyone can hear. So I'm reading aloud the color of law and it's recorded so that people can have access to um, be able to the chapters. So each space is one chapter. You can go back anytime, share it for a resource, you know. So here we go. Chapter 9, State Sanctioned Violence, says in 1952, Wilbur Gray, a, I'm sorry, Wilbur Gary, a building contractor, was living with his family in one of Richmond's California's public housing projects. He was an African-American Navy veteran, a former shipyard worker, and vice commander of his American Legion post. The Gary family needed to find a new residence. Their apartment complex was slated for demolition because the federal Linham Act had required government projects for war workers to be temporary. A fellow Navy veteran, Lieutenant Commander Sidney Hogan, was moving out of Rollingwood, the suburb just outside Richmond, built during World War II with an FHA requirement that the suburb be covered with restrictive covenants. So what they're describing is this person um, had to move out of their house because when they say temporary, they really were built to be like torn down very shortly. So that's where they would put um, black people to live at in the temporary housing while they built like permanent housing for white war workers. Nonetheless, the Rollingwood Im Improvement Association of Homeowners Group insisted that his covenant gave it to the right, gave it the right to evict African-Americans. The NAACP came to the family's aid and dared the group to try to enforce the covenant. The neighbors then attempted to buy back the Gary house for nearly 15% more than the Gary's paid. They refused the offer. Soon after the Garys arrived, a mob of about 300 whites gathered outside their house shouting epithets, hurling bricks, one crashed through the front window and burning across on the lawn. For several days, police and county sheriff's deputies refused to step in, so the NAACP found it necessary to organize its own guards. A Communist Party-affiliated civil rights group also provided help. The journalist Jessica Mitford, in her book, A Fine Old Conflict, described her participation in the group's effort, which, con which included escorting Miss Gary and the children to work and school and patrolling nearby streets to alert the Garys to mobs that might be gathering. Meanwhile, the NAACP pressed California Governor Earl Warren, Warren, Attorney General Brown, and the local district attorney to step in. They eventually did so, ordering the city police and county sheriff to provide the family with protection. Still, the protests and harassment continued for another month. With continu continued pleas from Wilbur Gary and civil rights groups for the police to intervene, no arrests, however, were made. The sheriff's claimed that he did not have enough manpower to prevent the violence, yet a single arrest is probably all that would have been required to persuade the mob to withdraw. 
At about the same time, the Levitt Company began to build its second large development, this one in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia. Built post Shelley, the cent- oh, real quick, y'all, so if anyone else is in here, I, I'm having technical issues. I can't see anyone in the space. It's just showing me the title of the space, and then the screen is blank. Like, even I don't show up. So if you're requesting, I can't see it because for some reason it's tech. So I'm just going to read through, and the space is recorded, so we're good. So built post shelling, the Pennsylvania project did not have restricted covenants, but the FHA continued to support Levitt and other developers only if they refused to sell to African-Americans. So they're talking about a uh, construction project for homes in Philly where it did not have a restrictive covenant. And a restrictive covenant, again, was a clause within their deeds and the way in which they sold houses to say that you will not sell to African-Americans. Well, this one was built with that one. But the FHA still supported them because in their practice, they made sure never to rent to African-Americans up until this point. Robert Meredith, an African-American trucker who had delivered material to Levitt's Long Island project, won another contract with the company to deliver sheetrock to the Bucks County site. He settled his family in an African-American neighborhood in nearby Bristol. His son, Robert Jr., attended Bristol High School, graduating in 1955. He had a girlfriend there, Shirley Wilson, and he calls that he, I'm sorry, and he recalls that the Wilson family had attempted to move to Levittown, but was rebuffed by the Levitt company despite the negative publicity the Wilson's rejection had generated. I mentioned the flap, the term Robert Meredith Jr. uses in recalling the Wilson incident, because such instances were more commonplace than historians can document, and they must have had a profound effect on the awareness within African American community of how their housing options were limited. It is remarkable that African-American families continue to make the attempt to break into the white suburban life as they did at the Levittown in Bucks County. By the late 1950s, 50s, <laughs> in the late 1950s, white homeowners wanting to leave the development realized that it would be to their benefit to sell to African-Americans who, because they were desperate for housing, would pay more than whites. So it happened that in 1957, an African-American veteran, Bill Myers, and his wife, Daisy, found a Levington homeowner willing to sell. Like many Levington residents, Myers had served in World War II. He was discharged as a staff sergeant and held a steady job as a lab technician in the engineering department of a factory in nearby Trenton, New Jersey. Daisy Myers was a college graduate, and Bill Myers was, a, was taking courses toward a degree in electrical engineering. When no bank would provide a mortgage because the Myers family was Black, a New York City philanthropist offered to give them a private mortgage, and Bill and Daisy Myers, with their three children, occupied their new home. A few days later, the U.S. Post Office mail carrier, a a federal government employee performing his official duties, noticed that he was delivering mail to an African-American family. As he made his rounds, he shouted, niggers have moods into Levington. The fuck is wrong with these crackers? (laughs) I mean, for real, though, like your job is you deliver mail, you're a mailman and you see black people and you're like, yo, let me activate that white supremacist chip real quick. Like, that's what mm, let me keep reading. As many as 600 white demonstrators assembled in front of the house and pelted the family and his house with rocks. Some rented a unit next door to the Myers and set up a clubhouse from which the Confederate flag flew and music blared all night. Police arrived, but were ineffective. When Mr. Myers requested around-the-clock protection, the police chief told him that the department couldn't afford it. The town commissioners accused the state police of meddling because troopers were dispatched when the police failed to end the harassment. It was a needless worry. The state troopers also declined to perform their duty. For two months, law enforcement stood by as rocks were thrown. Crosses were burned. The Ku Klux Klan symbol was painted on the wall of the clubhouse next door, and the home of a family that had supported the Myers was vandalized. Some policemen assigned to protect the African-American family stood with the mob, joking and encouraging its participants. One sergeant was demoted to patrolman because he objected to orders he had been given not to interfere with rioters. So it's funny how they mentioned how the police and even the state troopers would come inside with the crackers that were doing the white terrorist attacks upon black families just living in their house. Right. And the reason why that's important is because if you have watched or been to in person uh, protests with Proud Boys and other white supremacist groups like the I already said, the Proud Boys, 
uh, I'm drawing a blank for some reason now naming all of them, but especially the Proud Boys, they still have clan marches out here, by the way. So if you've been to like the clan marches, the Proud Boys, Knights of Columbus, um, and other white supremacist groups, the three percenters, especially heavy out here in Texas is three percenters. If you've been to any of those, you'll always see police protection for them crackers, the same as they did back then. Like police and the state support white terrorism because it supports white supremacy. The district attorney approached Bill Myers and offered to purchase his property for a price substantially above what he had paid. Even though riot leaders were well known for several weeks, the police made no attempt to arrest them or to shut down the clubhouse. Again, we have to remember when we talk about police, Police are the arm of the state. They protect property, but they also protect people who deputize themselves to act on behalf of the state, i.e. neighbors who was turn their people into the state or terrorize on behalf of the state, uh, people who uphold like racist practices so that you can keep exploiting African-Americans and terrorizing black people and, and inflict violence upon them. Like that's who the police is there to protect. So we shouldn't be confused anymore that when we see them standing behind, beside these fucking fascists, that we're like, well, why? It's because police are the state. They are part of fascism. So that's why they stand next to these reactionaries and next to these fascists, like the three percenters, like the Proud Boys. Uh, let's see. The district attorney approached Bill Myers, offered him, oh, okay, to purchase his property and suspend, uh, substantially above what he had paid, even though riot. Riot leaders were well known for several weeks. The police made no attempt to arrest them or shut down the clubhouse. The federal government did not discipline or reprimand the mail carrier. Eventually, the Pennsylvania attorney general prosecuted some of the rioters by harassment for harassment and obtained an injunction against its continuation. The bill and Daisy Myers feeling constantly under threat lasted only another four years in 1961. They sold their Levingtown home and returned to the African-American neighborhood in York, Pennsylvania, where they had previously lived. Does the failure of police to protect Gary and Myers' family constitute government-sponsored du jour segregation? When police officers stood by without preventing the intimidation these families endured, were the African-American families' constitutional rights violated, or were they victims of rogue police officers from whom the state was not responsible? Certainly, we cannot hold the government accountable for even for every action of racial bias police officers. Yet, if these officers' superiors were aware of racial discrimination, discriminatory activities, conducted under color of law as they surely were and either encouraged these activities or took inadequate steps to restrain them, then these were no longer merely rogue actions, but expressed state policy that violated the 14th Amendment's guarantees of due process and equal protection. Real quick, again, this book is written by a cracker. So the way in which he says like, oh, they didn't do enough or they failed as though like they actually attempted. And even in instances where he admits they didn't attempt and that they just stood by, no, when we use words to describe the actions of the pigs, of the police, we have to be very intentional with it. And the reason why is because especially if we're writing our own books or when we're speaking to our own reality, when our, the next generation hears it, they need to not be confused on the purpose of the police and how they do work for the state and are agents of white supremacy. Like, we really need to get out that habit of indoctrinating each other that there are good cops and there's only some bad cops. No, all cops are bad. And it's needed for us to understand this in order for us to really understand the conditions we're under. If we apply that standard to police behavior in Rollingwood and in Levintown, we must conclude that law enforcement officers conspire to violate the civil rights of the Garys and the Myers and that this unremedied conspiracy of government authorities contributed to segregation of the communities for whose welfare they were responsible. Again, to me, it is much more in our benefit to look at police as exactly what they are, agents of the state. They're not former slave catchers. They're still slave catchers. And when you look at them for exactly who they are with no delusion, you know how to treat them. You would, you would start looking around and saying, well, damn, why do we allow slave catchers in our kids' school? Like, that should be insane to us. Like, we've allowed our, our kids, we say school to prison pipeline, but if we look at the way uh, kids' schools are built, elementary schools, high schools, middle schools are built, they look like prisons, and they run them like prisons. 
having slave catchers in the hallways where our kids go to drink water in a water fountain, getting harassed by school officers, that if a kid talks or doesn't raise their hand in class, a fucking slave catcher can go and slam them on the fucking ground, and we just think that's okay. And we want to blame the kid for, quote-unquote, not acting right. Not to mention they're in an environment where they're being treated like criminals, so what do you expect? Like, this is sick what we have allowed to be our normal. Especially when we know the whole history. Like, police only show up to either harm Black people, kidnap Black people, or to protect those that are doing the harming and killing of Black people. So they're our enemy. What the Gary and the Myers family experienced was not an aberration. During much of the 20th century, police tolerance and promotion of cross burnings, vandalism, arson, and other violent acts to maintain residential segregation was systemic and nationwide. The attacks on African-American pioneers sanctioned by elected officials and law enforcement officers could not have been attributable to whites' discomfort with a lower social class of neighbors. Wilbur and Boris Gary and Bill and Daisy Myers were solidly middle class. Because more affluent communities were close to them, the African-Americans who were victimized by such mob action often had higher occupation and social status than the white neighbors who assaulted them. The circumstances, so what he just described there is he's saying that the few Black people who got access to housing, to adequate housing that was placed in, strategically placed in cracker neighborhoods, they were of people who weren't what they would call like just regular working class. They actually came from just slightly better class position than the crackers they were trying to live among, is what they're saying. Like most of these crackers were like factory workers, while the black people who moved in were engineers, doctors, dentists, that type of shit. And they were playing three times more just to live next to these crackers who were factory workers, while these factory workers were harassing them, vandalizing their homes and their cars, harassing and beating up and attacking their children when they would go to the school bus, shit like that. And so basically his reason for bringing up their class status as black people, he was saying that these crackers weren't like responding to, I guess, the criminal element of black people, quote unquote, coming in. They were actually responding to the good black folk. I hate that juxtaposition because no one deserves what was endured by black people and what was forced upon black people. I don't give a fuck if you work at a fast food restaurant or if you don't have a job at all. None of this is ever justified. But I guess it's his way of playing up to respectability politics saying, you know, oh, these were the good Negroes and they still acted like this. This makes it more egregious. It's egregious either way. But I'm explaining like his wording here. And of course, I disagree with it. But because more affluent communities were close to them, the African-Americans were victimized by such mob actions, often at higher occupation of society status than the white neighbors who assaulted them. The circumstance be- belies that oft repeated claim that resistance to integration has been based on fears of deteriorating neighborhood quality. Indeed, when African-Americans did succeed in moving to previously white neighborhoods, they frequently were on their best behavior, that's in quotes, giving no cause or pretext for complaint, taking pains to make certain that their homes and lawns were better cared for than other on, than others on their blocks. So, so basically when he talks about how He's like, how could they like harass and, you know, terrorize this black family? They were actually the good ones who did better than others, who made sure their lawns were kept up, who looked good, who, you know, had the good jobs and wootie wootie woo. And they still treated them like less than human. So respectability politics does not work in our favor. And we need to toss that shit in the trash can of history, because in order to get our liberation, we need to stop trying to appeal to fucking troglodytes. Like, here these people are fucking terrorists and we're trying to perform for them to tell them that they should treat us as human when they're not acting humane. <laughs> and number one, how would it look like for the original humans to ask these fucking troglodytes for humanity? Like, fuck that, take that shit. They don't know how to act. We need to fucking line them up against the wall. For real, though. Like, we do not need to be living like this. The events in Chicago were only slightly more pervasive than elsewhere. Although most frequent in the post-World War II period, state-sanctioned violence to prevent integration began at the turn of the 20th century during the beginnings of Jim Crow era. In 1897, white property owners in Chicago's Woodlawn neighborhood declared war on African Americans, driving all African American families from the area with threats of violence, 
unimpeded by public authority. A decade later in Hyde Park, adjacent to Willow, the Hyde Park Improvement Pro Protective Club organized boycotts of merchants who sold to African-Americans and offered to buy out the homes of African-Americans who lived in the area. If these tactics were unsuccessful, whites engaged in vandalism, throwing rocks through African-Americans' windows. The leader of the club was a prominent attorney and the club, the club published a newspaper promoting segregation so it would not have been difficult for authorities to interfere with the conspiracy, but no measures were undertaken. From 1917 to 1921, when the Chicago ghetto was first rigidly defined, there were 58 fire bombings of homes in white border areas to which African-Americans have moved with no arrests or prosecutions. Y'all hear that shit? <laughs> no, but for real, for real, did y'all hear that shit? From 1917 to 1921, when the Chicago ghetto was first rigidly defined, there were 58 fire bombings of homes in white border areas to which African-Americans have moved with no arrest or prosecution. They talked about how there were 58 bombings from residents in white neighborhoods who went and bombed black neighborhoods. Can you imagine some shit like that? Like they always talk about living in a war zone. Shit. These white terrorists literally kept our people in a war zone situation. Imagine that PTSD, that trauma. Growing up in that shit. Insane. Man, this country gonna pay what the fuck it owes. I'm trying to tell you. Re revolution will happen in our lifetime. Okay, so firebombs in White House, African American, with no arrest or prosecution, despite the deaths of two African American residents. In one case, explosives were lobbed at the home of Richmond B. Harrison, a well-known Black Shakespearean actor who had purchased a house in a white neighborhood. The bombs were thrown from a vacant and locked apartment in a building next door. The police did not make a serious attempt to find the perpetrator, failing even to question the building's occupants, although few possible conspirators could have access to the apartment. So real quick, y'all. So we hear these instances of white terrorism, which they were bombing and killing Black people simply for living in the homes that they purchased, right? And then they talk about how the police reaction to that was to allow it to happen, to do no investigations, and also to assist in cover-ups. That's really important because as we see, like what started the uprising, uh, the uprisings like in police brutality and crackers who weren't police killing Black people, we see the reward system that's in place, right? So like when our brother Jordan Neely was killed on the subway in New York, and that cracker who killed him got a GoFundMe that went over $2 million and is still getting money in speaking engagement. Escorted police ever so gently, called a hero, had the media also cook up a propaganda campaign to, camp to promote him as a hero. And then we saw how what happened with uh, when our young brother Trayvon Martin was killed by that fucking cracker Zimmerman. And, and that cracker has still going to gun shows to this day and speaking engagements, millions of dollars. Darren Wilson, who killed Mike Brown, same deal. We keep seeing the same pattern where these people were the ones that do go viral, right? And we get to follow the case publicly. We see that the people who kill black people get rewarded and supported. The same thing was happening back then. It's the same thing that's happening now. The police did not make a serious... And I say that to say because we oftentimes talk about like, oh, shit, if I was alive back then, I'd be doing A, B, C, or D. Really? If you really want to know what you'd be doing back then under that white terrorism, just look at what you're doing today under white terrorism. That's all I got to say about that. Let's see. Nearly 30 of the 58 firebombs were concentrated in a six-month period in the spring of 1919, leading up to one of the nation's worst race riots set off when a white youth stoned an African-American swimmer who had drifted toward a public beach area generally understood to be for whites only. The swimmer drowned and policemen at the scene refused to arrest the attacker. Y'all, I just want to point out like how demented a whole community of crackers, of crackers have to be in order for that to just be like a common day at the beach. Like they saw someone black swimming, caved his head in with a fucking rock, he drowned, families and kids playing, and everyone's like, oh, no, he, that's cool. Let that soci sociopath live. And that was common. That's what I'm talking about when, they, when I see movies, and I'll make it short, but when I see movies like The Purge, I'll be like, these crackers act like they don't already do that. Like, that's not why they created marginalized groups where they constantly terrorize people. 
to this day. But you know, there was areas in which uh like they would they would go and uh, I'm talking about crackers and this is modern day and they would go and like shoot in black neighborhoods. Why? Because they, they admitted it was this documentary that had get, got exposed. They would admit that um, because they know they would blame it on black people doing drive-bys. And that's today sounding just like they grant grandpappies of fucking yesteryear. They sound the same way and do the same shit today. Like I said, if you want to know what you would do back then. And if you want to like, you know, Look down at your nose at people who, you know, actually fought and survived that shit and say they would call them weak. I don't know, bro. We better look in the mirror because right now, you know, under white terrorism and the cost of living rising, what do we do? We go to work the next day. There's no uh, there's no liberation struggle happening, no armed resistance to this. So we definitely need to look at our ancestors as the warriors that they absolutely were. Leading up to one of the nation's worst race riots set off when a white youth stoned African-American swimmer who had drifted toward a public beach area, generally understood to be for white use only. The swimmer drowned and policemen at the scene refused to arrest the attacker. Subsequent battles between whites and blacks left 38 dead, 23 of whom were African-American, and poisoned race relations in Chicago for years afterwards. Interracial violence continued unabated. In the first five Years after World War II, 357 reported incidences were directed against African Americans attempting to rent or buy in Chicago's racial border areas. From mid-1944 to mid-1946, there were 46 attacks on the homes of African Americans in white communities adjacent to Chicago's overcrowded Black neighborhoods. Of these, 29 were arson bombings, resulting in at least three deaths. In the first 10 months of 1947 alone, 26 arson bomb bombings occurred without an arrest. In 1951, Harvey Clark, an African-American Chicago bus driver and Air Force veteran, rented an apartment in all-white Cicero, a Chicago suburb. At first, the police forcefully attempted to prevent him, his wife, Johnetta, and two small children from occupying the apartment. They threatened him with arrest and worse if the family did not depart. Get out of Cicero, the police chief told the real estate agent who rented the apartment, adding, don't come back or you'll get a bullet through you. When Harvey Clark got a court injunction ordering the police to cease interfering with his occupancy and to afford him full protection from any attempt to restrain him, the police ignored it, making no effort, for example, to impede a group of teenagers who were pelting the apartment's window with stones. When the Clarks refused to leave, a mob of about 4,000 rioted, raiding the apartment, destroying fixtures, and throwing the family's belonging out of the window into the lawn and where they were set ablaze. I want us to sit with that. I didn't say 100. <laughs> I didn't say 50. Four motherfucking thousand of these crackers got together, stormed the apartment complex to terrorize this black family to get them to move out. And that's important to think about because these are everyday motherfucking crackers, right? These are people who work in grocery stores, hardware stores, whatever occupation you want to think of, nurses, doctors, dentists, lawyers, all are off of work and decide to terrorize Black people in their spare time. In order for segregation, or for a white supremacist system, a capitalist, racist fucking system to exist, it needs participants to make it happen. And these participants were everyday o phase, and it still are. So when they sit there and they say, you're, you're blaming us, for what's happening it's not our fault and and stupid ass people who want to be weak spined and talk about well it's not about white people it's about the system no niggas there would not be a system without people turning the wheels to helping it to function and to maintain and to keep it that way so yes if you find yourself in the in a in the imperial core in a white cellar colony your job is to destroy it if we're not destroying it we're maintaining and propping it up and we got to be real with that So let's see. The officers presented, presented arrested Owen. Time Magazine reported that the police acted like ushers, politely hand, handling the overthrow of a football stadium. That's mad, I want to say funny, but it, it's funny that we're hearing this now, that line talking about how basically the police were there for the 4,000 to help them, to usher them in. And we're, it's funny because we just saw uh, that one Cheeto crackers uh, mugshot, right? 
at how January 6th is when they showed up, when them crackers showed up at the White House, they literally were escorted, like made sure that they were good. Yeah, some got shot, but for the most part, the police there were literally guiding them to crackers like they were on a tour. White terrorism is protected in this country. And yet, when we think of violence, we're taught to think of violence as Black. Insane what the fucking system does to us mentally, the way in which they have us mentally enslaved to where we can't even see the real enemy and it's right there in our face. Governor Adlai Stevenson mobilized the National Guard to restore order. Although 118 rioters were arrested, a Cook County grand jury did not indict a single one. The grand jury, however, did indict Harvey Clark, the real estate agent, his NAACP attorney, and the white lady land and the white landlady who rented the apartment to him, as well as her attorney, on charges of inciting a riot, conspiring to lower property values. So what happened was is all the white terrorists, they were arrested but not indicted. I guarantee you they got the Kush treatment when they were locked up because the cops are on their side. So they didn't get in any trouble, basically. But the ones who did, the ones who got charges where the landlady who was renting the apartment to the black person, the black person themselves, and the NAACP, NAACP person who was helping that brother get an apartment, and they, they, oh, and let's see, the real estate agent. So all of them, who was literally just making sure someone has shelter, but again, it went against the status quo, they all paid. So that's what happens too. So there's no such thing as being, that's why people say there's no such thing as being neutral on a moving train. You're either on the side of the state or you're on the side of the oppressed. Because what happens when you're on the side of the oppressed, you are automatically against the state and they will make sure that you feel that violence because you're not standing with them. And even if you did stand with them, again, as black people, <laughs> we have no tie and no investment to this system. The system is our oppression. So we need to stop seeing ourselves as people who have investment in the system. I don't care what class position you sit in. Even though you might sit semi-comfortable, Guess, guess at what cost? The cost of the freedom of, and liberation of your people globally. So let's make that choice. Let's get free. In 1953, the Chicago Housing Authority leased apartments to African-American families for the first time in its Trumbull Park project in an all-white South Daring neighborhood. Ten years of, of sporadic mob violence ensued. Ten, yeah, ten fucking years of sporadic mob violence. Let me flip that page back, bro. Because it says in 1953, the Chicago Housing Authority leased apartments to African American families for the first time in the Trumbull Park project in the all white South Daring neighborhood. Ten years of mob violence ensued. The African American families required police protection during the entire period. As many as 1,200 policemen were deployed to guard African American families on the day a group of them moved in. But little was done to end the attacks by arresting and prosecuting the perpetrators. A neighborhood association, the South Daring Improvement Association, led the violence, but its officers were not charged with any crime. A few bomb throwers were arrested, but only after police had passively watched them launch their bombs. They faced only minor charges. An observer concluded that sympathy for white rioters was on the part of the average policeman was extreme. Addressing a South during, I'm sorry, addressing a South Daring Improvement Association meeting, the chief of the Chicago Park District Police commiserated with his audience that it is unfortunate the colored people choose to come out here. The mob's attacks were successful. The Chicago Housing Authority fired Elizabeth Wood, its executive director, who had authorized the leasing of apartments in previously all white projects to African Americans. In 1964, a white civil rights activist in Bridgeport, Chicago, Mayor Richard J. Daly, all white neighborhood, rented an apartment to African American college students. A mob gathered and pelted the apartments with rocks. Police entered the apartment, removed the students' belongings, and told them they returned, told them when they returned from school that they had been evicted. Events in Detroit and in its suburbs were similar. During the immediate post war period, the, ci the city saw more than 200 acts of intimidation and violence to deter African Americans from moving to predominantly white neighborhoods. Such an epidemic was possible because police could be counted on to stand by, making no effort to stop, much less to prevent the assault in 1968. An official of the Michigan Civil Rights Commission reported that our experience has been that nearly all attempts by black families to move to Detroit suburbs have been met with harassment. In the Philadelphia area, the attacks encountered by the Myers family were not unusual. In the first six months of 1955, 213 violent incidences 
<laughs> ensured that most African Americans remained in North Philly ghetto. Yo. See, that's why this book is fucking important and books like it. And the recounts of our people is most important because it will tell you, like, as you drive in your own city and you're like, why the fuck shit is like this? It's because it was made that way. And it's not a conspiracy. It's literal history. So in the Philadelphia area, the attacks encountered by Myers family were not unusual. In the first six months of 1955, 213 violent incidents ensured that most African-Americans remained in North Philly, Philly ghetto. Some incidences involved movement, uh, move in violence like that experienced by the Myers. Others involved white teenagers defending what they considered a neighborhood boundary that African-Americans should not cross. So that's important that they keep bringing up teenagers. And I like that they they specify the age only because we have this bad habit that I've heard people say that, oh, racism will go away over time and that the old people would die off as though their kids aren't not fucking racist as well. Like, of course, their kids are going to participate in upholding white supremacy and why it has continued for so long. There is no guarantee that it would die off. We're 500 plus years into this. We keep waiting for them to die. They're never, it's not going to happen. You're going to have to kill them. Like, that's how that goes. You overthrow power with greater power. That has always been the rule. And so I wanted to highlight that, that yes, teenagers would, would literally participate. It was, racism is like a baton handed down from like generation to generation because they understand what empire they live in and what it takes to maintain it. It takes a hierarchy, a racial caste system, and an exploited class that you keep under the, your fucking butt, boot so that you can ke keep exploiting their labor. That's what it takes to maintain empire and consistent violence. So we keep waiting for it to get bad. And I'm trying to convince y'all like, hey, y'all, it is bad. <laughs> we just starting to get used to it. <laughs> Although in some cases, perpetrators might have been difficult to identify, it is improbable that police were incapable of finding a sufficient number of prevent repetitive conflict. In the Los Angeles area, cross burning, dynamite bombings, rocks thrown through windows, graffiti, and other acts of vandalism, as well as numerous phone threats, greeted African-Americans who found housing in neighborhoods just outside their existing areas of concentration. In 1945, an entire family, father, mother, and two children, was killed when its new home in an all-white neighborhood was blown up. Of the more than 100 incidences of move-in bombings and vandalism that occurred in Los Angeles between 1950 and 1965, only one led to an arrest and prosecution. And what was because, oh, I'm sorry, and that was because the California Attorney General took over the case after local police and prosecutors claimed they were unable to find anyone in charge. Although the 1968 Fair Housing Act made violence to prevent neighborhood interrogation a federal crime, and the Department of Justice prosecuted several cases, frequent attacks on African Americans attempting to leave predominantly Black areas continued into the 1980s. The Southern Poverty Law Center found that in 1985 to 86, only about one quarter of these incidences were prosecuted, but the share in which charges were brought grew rapidly from 1985 to 1990, up to 75%. That such an increase in the rate of prosecution was possible suggests how tolerant of these crimes police and prosecutors had previously been. Still, the center documented 130 cases of move-in violence in 1989 alone. During the mid-20th century, local police and the FBI went to extraordinary lengths to infiltrate and disrupt liberal, liberal and left-wing political groups as well as organized crime syndicates. That they did not act similarly in a case of nationwide terror campaign against African Americans who interrogated previously white communities should be deemed at the least complicity in violence. So what that's saying, right, is he highlights that the police were, you know, literally trying to infiltrate like left-wing political groups because they saw them as a threat to the state. But these white terrorists weren't being infiltrated in the same way. They were actually working in broad daylight and were not seen as a threat. And that's important because somehow, not somehow, through propaganda and other means of indoctrination, we'll sit there and buy the story that police are there to protect and serve and therefore respond to all acts of violence the same. And even though in front of our own eyes and even those well documented that that is not the case, we still have problems talking to people about fuck the police. And what that means is when you say fuck police, fuck 12, you don't fuck with them. Meaning you're going to have to create community programs 
community self-defense programs in which we're going to have to stop being reliant on police. Like, so how do we deal with conflict in our own community? How do we deal with intra-community violence without calling the state? That is questions and initiatives we need to start backing up that already exist in some places, but not enough. And that, that's what happens when you, when you understand that, yes, all cops are bastards, all of them, no exception. Let's see. And again, how they supported white terrorism. So they could have stopped it. They didn't want to because it worked in the benefit of the state. Terrorizing, terrorizing black people is as American as pie. That's why it continues. That's why it's trending. That's why we can watch on loop black people being killed, kids included. That's why we can have whole ass entertainment shows about scared straight where we watch black children because they don't behave, quote unquote, literally be told and threatened with rape and violence in jail. And we look at that as entertainment. And we think that's normal. Nor can the failure to control mob assaults be blamed on police officers who acted without explicit authorization of their superiors. In recent years, we have seen several examples of the choices that confront public officials and analogous situations when a police officer has killed or beaten an African-American man with apparent racial motivation, we now expect that the officer superiors will fire him or her if there is doubt about whether a citizen's civil rights were violated. We'll suspend the officer pending an investigation. That's a whole fucking lie, but all right. If supervisors fail to take such measures, we expect still higher authorities to intervene. Okay. If they do not, we can reasonably assume that the police officer's approach fit within the bounds of what his or her superiors considered appropriate response and reflect governmental policies. In 1954, Andrew Wade, an African-American electrical contractor and Korean War Navy veteran, wanted to purchase a house in middle-class African-American neighborhood of Louisville, Kentucky, but couldn't find anything suitable. A friend and prominent left-wing activist, Carl Braden, suggested he look at a, at a white middle-class community instead. Braden and his wife, Anne, then agreed to buy a house for Andrew Wade and his family, Charlotte. The Wades found a property in Chevalier, an all-white suburb, which the Bradens bought and signing over the deed. So again, it mentions left-wing activists for a reason, because as we're in an ongoing red scare, and words like socialist and communist scare us, we have to understand why and how we got here and to this point of indoctrination that we're against the very ideologies and you know groups that stood beside us not just stood beside us that actually work in implementing our liberation and you know confronting state violence that now you hear those very words and you get triggered but yet you could be cozy with republicans and white supremacists understand how, how the fuck did we get here is the question we need to keep asking ourselves but yeah that was another thing so this the state you know, of course, talking about the police would constantly, you know, aid in the white terrorism of black people, but then also, you know, terrorize black people themselves, as well as left wing like activism. When they said left wing, they mean socialist and communist. The Wades found a property. In, oh, I'm sorry. When the Wades and their child were moving in, a crowd gathered in front and a cross was burned on an empty lot next door. On the first evening in the family spent at home, a rock crashed through its window front window with a message tied to it, nigger get out. And later that night, 10 rifle shots were fired through the glass of his kitchen door. Under the watch of a police guard, demonstrations continued for a month until the house was dynamited. The police guard said he saw nothing. There was one arrest following the Wade's moving in of Andrew Wade and a friend uh, for a breach of the peace because Mr. Wade had failed to notify the police that the friend would be visiting. Real quick, we're talking about like house bombings and I'm almost done with this chapter. I would encourage people to go and look. A couple of years ago, they were bombing, like, not only Black churches, but NAACP offices. And it's funny, not funny, but it's fucked up how that happened. There was a blimp in the news, and then it kind of went away. And not only that, if y'all look up how many crosses have been being burned on lawns of Black people, that would shock you. And I'm talking about in present day, not in the 60s. I'm talking about what's happening right now. And the reason why that's important is because when I saw you know, uh, Trump's mugshot, right? Me and my baby moms was talking and we was like, yo, that cracker is about to get reelected. 
it, like through on some real shit. Because when he posted, when he retweeted his like own or tweeted his own mugshot, I think we uh, we underestimate the thrill and the bloodlust of crackers who like enjoy that shit, who are waiting for like a fascist regime and a time to have an all on purge type environment in society. But I say that to say, like the amount of everyday crackers, I'm talking about separate from being like a, a state actor, like, um, like a cop or something. I'm talking about just the everyday cracker who works a nine to five. If you look in your local area at the amount of violence and white terrorism, there has been an uptick against black people. A huge uptick. A brother out in, I want to say, Atlanta, or either it was Mississippi, where he was hung from um, a playground. You know where the swings have that bar? He was hung from there, his feet touching the ground. He didn't lynch himself. Like, he was literally chased in a truck, called his wife and told them, like, these motherfuckers are chasing me. And he was killed and was right by a police station. There was another brother, same thing, called his mom, said, these crackers are chasing me. And he, he was found dismembered. I can go story after story after story about this happening now, right now, in our time. Like, and the reason why I brought up that Cheeto cracker is because... <laughs> He feeds off that shit. Like, they see his picture and his mugshot. They don't get deterred. They're not like, oh, he's a criminal, therefore he's ineligible to be president. No, they look at that as, like, a calling card. They're like, you know what? We've been waiting for the day that we could be a whole sociopaths with no, um, with no shame, with no retribution, with no kind of, we don't have to get held accountable. And Trump gives them that hope. And he tells them, hey, do what the fuck you want to do. And they can't wait for that. So when his mugshot got up, I was just like, yo, I don't think we're prepared, organized, or ready for what's about to happen. And we really need to be. We think because we, like, quote unquote, survived the first time that we won't die the next time. I don't know, y'all. Let's, th let's really think about where we're at. Although the chief acknowledged that both the dynamiter and the cross burners had confessed, the perpetrators were not indicted. Instead, a grand jury indicted Carl and Ann Braden, along with four others from whom the jury accused of conspiring to stir up racial conflict by selling the house to African-Americans. The former charge was sedition. Charges against the others were dropped, but Carl Braden was sentenced to 15 years in prison. He eventually won release on appeal, and the Wades went back to Louisville's African-American area. So let that sink in. So remember, a jury is a people of your peers, meaning mother crackers that just be around the way also were there and were like, nah, not only are we not going to indict the motherfuckers who did it, the white terrorists who did it, we're going to indict the people who were victimized by white terrorists and the people who sold them housing. When, when we say it takes a village, we got to also understand it takes a village to uphold a fascist system as well. Such violence in Kentucky did not end in 1950s. In 1985, Robert and Martha Marshall bought a home in Sylvania, another suburb of Louisville, that had remained exclusively white. Their house was firebombed on the night they moved in. A month later, a second arson attack destroyed the house. A few hours before, a Ku Klux Klan meeting at which a speaker boasted that no African Americans would be permitted to live in Sylvania. The, the Marshall family then sued a county police officer who had been identified as a member of the Klan. The officer testified that about half of the 40 Klan members known to him were also the police department and that his superiors condoned Officer Klan's membership as long as information did not become public. So here's real quick. That's important because as we understand now, um, it talks about. I was actually going to bring up a book and it's called. Dangerous Minds, I believe I might have that wrong, but it's by Jeff Smith and basically it's about the. It critiques the way our jobs are set up and how they're set up to actually, like, you know, fuck us up, like, assimilate us into the system and break us down. So, anyways, it, one of the topics he talked on about was police and how many of uh, police are actually belong to white supremacist gangs. So, yeah, they don't have to be a part of the one white supremacist terrorist organization known as the KKK. They have many and new ones that pop up all the time. And with these gangs, they come out with symbols, they come out with clothing and slogans and all kind of shit. So when people say, yeah, that cracker throwing up the OK symbols of white supremacists and people want to laugh and say, oh, the OK sign? Yes, motherfuckers, that's what they do. They co-opt already existing things to try to hide behind, you know, playing dumb and saying, oh, it's just an OK symbol. 
Or no, it's actually a symbol of, you know, from Hindu. It's not actually a swastika. No, motherfuckers. They will co-opt symbols and languages and slogans and use it to hide behind while actively engaging in white terrorism. Many police this day literally belong to white supremacist gangs and have tattoos all over their body with it. Some of the ways in which you get into these white supremacist gangs as police is by killing black people for fun. So, yeah. Same practice of then is still happening today. And yet we have a problem saying all cops are bastards. That's a problem. Uh, Let's see. Many years ago, I read The Wall Between Anne Brayton's memoir that described how she and her husband were prosecuted by the state of Kentucky for helping Andrew Wade attempt to live in a white neighborhood. I remember the account when in, in 2007, the U.S. Supreme Court prohibited the Louisville School District from carrying out a racial integration plan and on the ground that segregation of Louisville is a product of not of state action, but private choices. State-sponsored violence was a means, along with many others, by which all levels of government maintained segregation in Louisville and elsewhere. The Wades and Marshalls were only two middle-class families confronted with hostile state power when they tried to cross the residential color line. Many other middle-class African-Americans in Louisville were intimidated from attempting to live in neighborhoods their own choosing after hearing of the Wade and Marshall experiences. Did the next generation imbibe a fear of integration from their parents? How long do memories of such events last? How long do they continue to intimidate? I'm going to read that last part again because I sped through it, but it's actually good questions we should ask ourselves, especially when viewing history and our present. It says, how many other middle-class African-Americans in Louisville were intimidated from attempting to live in neighborhoods of their own choosing after hearing of the Wade and Marshall experiences? That's an important question because oftentimes, like today, if it's not trending, we don't think it happened. And that is a misstep on our part. So I oftentimes tell people, whatever you see that's mainstream or being passed around and popular, that's probably like the tip of the iceberg. And below the water, the iceberg is fucking huge. So again, when we see one trending top, uh, one trending person being killed by police or by a, just a cracker who's not a cop, understand there's many more we don't know the names of. Many more. And then it says, did the next generation imbibe a fear of integration from their parents? Absolutely. Even the way in which we talk about integration is due to the violence that was inflicted upon us. Like we tend, we tend to hear people talk about, oh, integration, Martin Luther King just wanted to fuck white women. Oh, integration, that's because our soft ass ancestors wanted to be next to white folks. That is not what integration was. And we have to stop selling ourselves short and falling for the propaganda. What did Malcolm X tell us? The newspapers will have you hating the, the liberators while loving your oppressor. And that's literally what they do. How long do the memories of such events last? I would, I would say to take it beyond the literal and be like, how does that live like in our body? So trauma can be passed down you know, to, from generation to generation. How long does that trauma get passed down is something we need to ask. How long do they continue to intimidate? To this fucking day. <laughs> to this day. It hasn't stopped. So that's the end of chapter nine. Um, again, I can't see the screen and it's like some kind of glitch, but I've been told that y'all can't hear me. So that's why I continue with the recording. So if you request it, I wasn't ignoring you. I literally can't see it. It's a, it's a glitch in the space. But whoever did come, again, I can't see anybody. You know, I'm glad you did. The next chapter is chapter 10, suppressed incomes. And yeah, it's just going to keep getting better and better throughout the book. So appreciate y'all coming. Be safe. And of course, always, you know, it's forward ever, never backward. Revolution must happen in our lifetime.